When I was a little kid, I believed Jardel was the greatest striker that had ever lived. My father used to tell me that back when he played for Porto, football became a boring sport. Goals didn't mean anything anymore, it was always the same. Drulovic dribbled his way along the sideline and then whipped across, and from the moment the ball left his foot, you just knew Jardel would put it in the back of the net. Same outcome every time. It was just too good. Now I'm all grown up, kind of, and I find myself wondering if all this time that was just a fairy tale. People talk about the greats and Jardel is nowhere to be found. Last I heard, he was taking part in some celebrity reality show. I asked my father, what happened? How come he never got a shot at one of the big clubs? He doesn't have much of an answer either, so I went out looking for one. And what I found left me as shocked as it left me depressed. So, here's that story. Jardel once said that, right from back when I was still in my mom's belly, I was already trying to score some headers. It was meant for me. It's like God said, this crazy bastard right there is gonna score a truckload of goals. Jardel didn't grow up poor, but his father had a serious problem with booze, and domestic violence was an everyday thing. Just another excuse for Jardel to leave the house and roam the streets. His focus was on football above anything else. By the age of 14, he was already being paid to play football in the streets. Eventually, he joined his first academy at Fortaleza and very soon after he moved to Vasco da Gama. Once there, he would top the goal-scoring charts at every level and soon he'd be put into the first team, immediately showing promise, scoring a late winner with his very first touch for the club. From there on out, he just kept on pushing it further. The next year, he was an under-21 world champion, despite barely getting any time in the competition. And by his third season, he finally took the leap into the main team through the most unfortunate of circumstances. Jardel was seen as a player on the brink. If one player happened to be out, it got called up. And then, this happened. Vener Augusto de Souza was a 23-year-old winger on the come-up and after driving to São Paulo to meet with representatives of Stuttgart, Vener asked his friend to drive on the way back. He reclined his seat and fell asleep. At around 5am, his friend fell asleep at the wheel. If you're sensitive towards these kinds of things, I'd advise you to skip forward a few seconds. They ended up hitting a tree at high speeds. The driver broke both of his legs but survived. Vener, on the other hand, hit his head on the ceiling, being knocked out and eventually passing away, asphyxiated by his own seatbelt. Oddly enough, despite surviving this accident, the driver would be murdered two years later on suspicion of involvement with drug trafficking. As dark as it might sound, only less than a month after this tragedy, Jardel would score both goals of the deciding final match to make Vasco regional champions, immediately cementing himself as a fan favorite. These performances would attract the attention of Grêmio, who were bolstering their squad ever since they managed to qualify to the Copa Libertadores. So, a loan was arranged and Jardel stepped his game up to a whole new level with four goals in six matches in the Libertadores group stage. And in a knockout, it was massive. After two goals in the first match, he met rivals Palmeiras in the quarterfinals, who had an impressive squad with the likes of Rivaldo, Roberto Carlos and Cafu. Despite Grêmio's first leg 5-0 win, with Jardel scoring a hat-trick, Palmeiras scored 5 in the second leg as well, and had Jardel not scored yet another goal, they would have gone to extra time. The Libertadores is a wild tournament, you gotta give them that. In the semi-finals, Jardel scored another and once the final came around, of course, he was the first one to score as Grêmio won 4-2 and became South American champions for the second time in their history, with Jardel as the tournament's top scorer with 12 goals, getting twice as many as any other player. I told you he was special. When asked about how it was to dribble Roberto Carlos and Cafu, he said, I don't dribble, I couldn't do it, I could do something not many people know how to do today though and that's scoring goals, a lot of them. At this point, the love for Jardel was so intense that a campaign was started to try to raise money to permanently transfer him from Vasco. Ultimately, it failed, and between investment groups and a failed transfer to Glasgow Rangers, Benfica would try their luck and would miss out, refusing to pay an extra 100,000 euros, and as usual, Porto would come out of nowhere and steal him from their rivals. In his first training session, he would arrive very tired and would repeatedly lose possession of the ball. So much so, that his eventual partner, Drulovic, would famously ask, Yal paid 6 million for him and he can't even control the ball? 
despite this, by his third game, he was already on four goals and had gotten himself a brace at San Siro, despite playing only 28 minutes and against the likes of Maldini and Desai. From that day on, Drulovic decided to never question his methods again, and so began the deadliest duo of Portuguese football. Over the rest of the season, he would go on to score 35 goals, with three of them coming against rivals Benfica, being the league's top scorer as Porto won the league. The next season, not surprisingly at all, he kept going, and it was on this season that one of my favorite stories took place. Porto met 3rd Division Juventude de Évora for the early rounds of the Portuguese Cup, and so, rightfully, Jardel and Drulovic set out the match, but then, with 45 minutes gone, Porto were only winning 1-0 with a penalty, so the coach, afraid of what could happen, told them both to warm up and come in. Looking back on the match, Jardel would say, the coach didn't have to say a word, we knew what to do. Two minutes into the second half, Jardel scored his first goal. And 42 minutes later, Drulovic had assisted Jardel five times and backed the goal himself. The score was 9 to 1. Jardel had scored 7, a penalty, a backhill, one where he dribbled the keeper, a rabona, and of course three headers. In the end, the keeper said, I only felt hopelessness, but in a good way. Jardel broke me into pieces. To finish off the season, he scored in the final of the Portuguese Cup to get Porto the domestic double. As you might imagine, he was a top scorer in both competitions, he even averaged a goal every 21 minutes in the Cup. But still, to the shock of many, over summer, Jardel was not called up to the World Cup with Brazil, losing his spot to Edmundo, who had joined Fiorentina midway through the season and had so far only scored 4 goals for his new club. Even as Romário got injured, Zagallo opted to call up another midfielder instead of bringing him in. This was the type of upset that would destroy his career at one point. In his third season, he won the league once again and finally managed to take home the European Golden Boot with 36 league goals. But I know what you're thinking at this point. Oh sure, the numbers are impressive, but the Portuguese league just isn't all that competitive. He probably couldn't do it against top teams. First of all, he was kind of a big game player. Second, just watch what happened next. Right from the start of the next season, he scored two goals to win the Super Cup, then a goal against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu, and another two once he played them at home, leading Porto to beat them for the first time in 30 years. By the end of the year, he was on 29 goals already and earned his first nomination to the Ballon d'Or, finishing as the second best Brazilian player, only behind Rivaldo, who won the whole thing. Right after that, Porto met Barcelona at the Camp Nou and Jardel put them in front at the start and eventually even scored another, though Porto lost 4-2. In the quarterfinals, Porto faced Bayern Munich and at home, Jardel quickly put Porto in front but they still ended up settling for a draw. Then, in the away leg, Porto conceded first but in the 90th minute Jardel scored to tie the game and keep Porto's hopes alive, but still, in injury time, they managed to concede again and be knocked out. By the end of the season, Jardel was the top scorer of the Champions League with 10 goals, a number that had only been reached once in the 10 years before him. To add to this disappointment, despite 32 league goals, 16 more than any other player, Porto somehow finished second for the first time since Jardel arrived in Portugal. Alongside this, the Portuguese league's coefficient would be lowered and he would lose out on another European golden boot by a mere 3 points, despite scoring 8 goals more than winner Kevin Phillips did that season. A player who only played 2 cup matches, didn't take part in any continental tournaments that year and had kept a 40% lower goal scoring frequency than Jardel across all competitions. It is what it is, but one thing was certain, Jardel not only deserved the big move, he needed one. Still, there was some reluctance. Maybe it was because of his temperament or because of his constant misses with the Brazilian national team. Regardless, Inter Milan contacted him, they had just lost their star player Ronaldo Fenomeno to an incredibly harsh injury that would put him out for two years. It made a lot of sense to get Jardel. But instead, they opted for Akan Sukur, leaving Galatasaray without a top striker. And so, Jardel took that opportunity instead, and it would be this move that started his downfall. Upon arriving at Galatasaray, Prime Minister Mesut Yilmaz made a statement declaring that one of the world's top four players had arrived. Though that was certainly an overstatement, nobody could have asked Jardel for more when it came to his first few months at the club. 
In his first match for them in the Champions League playoff round, Jardel scored both goals in their 2-1 win, eventually scoring another to clinch their spot in the tournament. In an even more unbelievable moment, right on his third match, Jardel scored five goals. He clearly didn't need any time to adapt. Jardel always enjoyed himself against Real Madrid. And would you guess what, the crazy bastard did it again, scoring twice against them to bring the European Super Cup to Turkey. Over that season, Jardel was averaging a goal every game in the league and by the turn of the year, he was nominated to the Ballon d'Or again, and in the Champions League, he was key, sealing Galatasaray's spot in the knockout stages, scoring in both games against AC Milan, and then the winning goal as they stunned Real Madrid again in the quarterfinals despite eventually going out after a second leg defeat. With Aji and Jardel combining effortlessly, Galatasaray had found the recipe for success. Jardel had even been the Champions League top scorer once again, if you account for the playoff matches. But over time, he began feeling disappointed with the club. They had stopped paying him and he had struggled internationally just as much as his previous clubs. Inter once again flirted with the idea of signing him as Akan Sukur had been a massive failure, but just as before, nothing came of it. Same thing with Benfica as one of the candidates to their presidency used Jardel as a way to promote his campaign despite never having any serious intention of securing his transfer. In a move almost out of anger, after offers from Porto, Marseille and Monaco, he ended up joining Benfica's city rival Sporting CP instead. And trust me, this anger associated with his burning desire to make the squad for the 2002 World Cup fueled some of his best performances to date. He scored in all of his first 7 matches for Sporting, totaling 20 goals in his first 13. Over this season, Jardel managed to get Sporting to win the domestic double for the first time in 20 years, totaling out an incredible 55 goals in just 41 matches. In the league alone, he managed 42, only two players had ever managed more than that, and both did it in a completely different era of football. No matter what the coefficients were, that season it was undeniable, and once again, the European Golden Boot winner. He was absolutely mind-blowing, but then everything crumbled so fast, no one could have even been there to pick up the pieces. At this point, no matter where he went, he delivered results. Against top teams like Real Madrid, Barcelona and AC Milan, he had 11 goals in 10 matches. Just ridiculous. He was already on 25 Champions League goals, more than Ronaldinho, Ronaldo or Romario. At one point, Jardel would tell the press, if I don't get called up to the World Cup, I think I will be traumatized. But regardless of all that, that summer, Jardel was not called up once again. Instead, Scolari called up Edilson, who was playing in Japan and would score 7 goals that year, and Louis Zão, who played for Grêmio and would score an even less impressive 3 goals. As Drogba once said, this is a disgrace. Jardel was already doing pretty bad emotionally because of all of this, but then it got worse. Brazil were champions without him, a possible deal with Barcelona fell through, and then even his wife divorced him, all in pretty much the same month. Jardel would openly admit to be experiencing some of the worst times in his life, and this was before anyone realized he had a drug problem dating back to his first years in Europe. If before it was just something he did during the summer, with the club being aware of it and constantly managing it, that time he was alone and did it so much that once he had to go back to his normal life, he just couldn't. Before August ended, Jardel would overdose and end up being put under constant medical care. Soon it would all spiral into him telling the press that he didn't want to go back to Portugal. Sporting was oddly accepting of this behavior, allowing him to stay in Brazil for a while and only requesting monthly reports from a doctor. But of course, eventually those stopped coming, his wages were denied and after some back and forth, Jardel was back. It would actually be at this point that famously Jardel would become a mentor to a young Cristiano Ronaldo, teaching him how to score headers, and funnily enough, Cristiano would even date Jardel's sister. He has even jokingly said he wishes they got married. Regardless, he was a major disappointment. Besides a good patch in February, he only managed 4 goals before the end of the season, and then it got worse, as he showed up drunk at the hotel and fell on the pool injuring his knee. After this, Sporting gave up on him. 
with coach Laszlo Bolani even saying the graveyards are full of undisputable players, which is pretty iconic. By summer, he would join Bolton for 1.5 million, 8.5 less than Sporting had requested from Barcelona a year earlier. At Bolton, Sam Allardyce, who had rejuvenated Okosha, was hoping to do the same to Jardel, but it was a lost cause. His fitness had gone completely out of the window. By January, he had three goals and they offloaded them to Ancona in Italy. It was even worse there. Only three matches played before the season ended. Once nicknamed Super Mario in Portugal, now fans nicknamed him Lardel, in reference to him being completely overweight. At this point, he almost signed for Palmeiras, but right before signing the deal, he has to be excused for a few days to attend his grandma's funeral. But he ended up going missing, and when they finally found him, it was proven he had missed the funeral to go play bingo. From here on out, it would be absolute chaos. Four years after leaving Sporting, he had already played for four different teams, now including Newell's Old Boys and Goyas, never managing more than five matches in a season. He even tried coming back to Portugal, playing for newly promoted Beira Mar, but after half a season, he was gone. Then came Cyprus and then Australia, and by 2008, he would open up about his drug use for the first time and claim that he was now clean. What followed were stays in several minor clubs in Brazil, Bulgaria and finally Saudi Arabia as the player turned 37 years old. Since getting clean, he actually went back to relatively good goal-scoring form, totaling 44 goals in 58 matches over the last three years of his career. Still, it was bittersweet to witness a hero of another time now running himself into the ground in search of just a little bit of what he had once possessed. So yeah. This was just another sort of cautionary tale, the whole career of Jardel in a video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, I'll see you again next week. Bye.